Memorial Day weekend, the unofficial start of summer vacation. While we played and barbecued, an ominous cloud was building on the horizon. There had been some spring flooding along the Missouri and Mississippi, but that happened every few years. A couple of feet of river water on a few low-lying areas. The spring of 93 was nothing special. But miles upriver in Des Moines, Davenport, Dubuque, all along the upper Mississippi, the spring rains continued falling and the rivers began rising. A wet spring would evolve into a record-breaking summer. Hello, I'm Rick Edlin. And I'm Karen Foss. From its quiet beginnings, the Great Flood of 93 evolved into a story you'll tell your children and your grandchildren. And it may be years before the end of the story is written. But mere words alone can never express the furious power of the swollen Mississippi or the despair of a family learning they may never go home again. Over the next hour, we'll chronicle two months that changed St. Louis forever. In the words of those who reported the flood and those who lived through it. Looking back, it's difficult to believe that the Great Flood of 93 began with this small levee near St. Peter's being topped. The crisis would grow slowly at first, but that July 4th weekend, the Coast Guard was watching area rivers on guard for what might follow. No boating or skiing here on the Mississippi this 4th of July weekend. The Coast Guard has closed the river from Dubuque, Iowa to St. Louis, a 300-mile stretch. It's uh, pretty dangerous due to the fact of the swift currents, the debris that's floating down the river, and the, uh, the, the height of the water right now. In St. Louis, the Coast Guard was being cautious as the Mississippi crept over 30 feet. There are no indications of an immediate threat to the public. There are no indications that we have of levee problems. But uh, nonetheless, we're posturing uh, to assist should there be need, uh, a need for us. Flood stage for this section of the river is 30 feet. The Coast Guard tells me the river right here at the riverfront is already at 31 feet and expected to rise to 33 feet by this Saturday. That means the street where I'm standing is expected to be underwater. A few days later, in an early skirmish with the Missouri, St. Charles saw its first flooding. In early July, the first major battle would take place in West Alton, Missouri, a town sandwiched between the Mississippi and the Missouri. As the rivers attacked, the only defenses were shovels, sand, and determination. We saw the uh, ad on TV, well, not an ad, but uh, asking for help. And so we decided to come over and, and uh, help out. Brought your own shovel? Brought our own shovel, that's right. Your last name is Miracle. Are you expecting one on the river today? I hope so. <laughs> How much sand are you willing to move here today? Well, as long as it takes, I guess. But only two days later, the force of the Mississippi would prove too much for the sandbaggers. In West Alton, the cry went out to evacuate. The Mississippi had won. Attempts to sandbag did not work. Crews opened up a section of the levee to prevent a major break. The National Guard is ordering people to get out before the Mississippi River gets in. Here's West Alton's main street. Last night, cars and trucks. Today, John boats and canoes. Water is up to the porches and at the top of this truck. The river is raging through this railroad viaduct. In shallow areas, worms, toads, and snakes are trying to get away from the flood. A child's toy floats in a cornfield. Residents wanting in must use the railroad tracks to get in. One man sports a pistol. For snakes, he says, maybe looters and reporters, too. Families peer down at their flooded town, some with tears in their eyes. Many residents have left, but a lot are staying, like George Smith, who has one inch of water in his living room. Well, you got to live somewhere. Here's the 1973 watermark on the Catholic Church. A couple of dogs have a bit of a problem. Neighbors say they will be taken care of. The volunteer fire department also has a problem, too much water. Soon the water patrol will take over the parking lot and the building. The statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary barely above water. While many residents are praying, the water drops soon. Pumps are working overtime in Alton, draining flooded basements. Many stores near the river have flooded basements. Volunteers and city crews are building a temporary levee. Highway retainers, sand, and plastic wrap. 
What we're going to end up doing is uh, trying to save the, the floors in these buildings here and you know, keep the water back because uh, it's going to be just about a floor level, about four inches above the floors of these buildings if we don't try to stop the water from flowing in there. West Alton was only the first town to fall. On the Missouri River, the rushing water proved to be too powerful for a levee between New Haven and Herman. It burst and water swallowed chunks of the levee, washing into fields, destroying wheat, corn, and soybean crops. In Washington, Missouri, sections of Highway 94 are washed out. Rushing water is ignoring a stop sign and plowing across an intersection. In St. Charles, Frontier Park was now underwater. Just the day before, the water was more than 20 yards from the gazebo. Now it surrounds it. Water also surrounds a cornfield in St. Charles where three deer are safe for now with plenty to eat. On the Mississippi River in Grafton where the Mississippi meets the Illinois River, water was everywhere in a town usually known for its summer tourism. A levee burst along the Mississippi sending water cascading over to what was once the dry side of the river banks. The river edge along downtown Alton, Illinois was overflowing. And here in St. Louis, the Mississippi River was rising well above the Lenore K. Sullivan Boulevard, making its way to the arch grounds. And here was perhaps the brightest aspect of a very dark time. Everywhere, strangers were helping strangers. Day after day, even though homes were lost and the summer heat bore down, hundreds answered when the call went out, sandbaggers needed. The thing I boil it down to, the bad brings the good out of everybody. That's, that's the way I boil it down to it. And it's, it's unreal, these guys here would, like I say, you don't know, the strangers just come down the street and jump in and start working. Really a good feel. And that fact of business, I'll be honest with you, I'd never make it without it. We're on the list, Starkey. Who are you for? On the sandbag lines, the scene was always tense, sometimes chaotic, even for St. Charles emergency worker Jim Runyon's. Who did? I don't know okay. if everybody that was here, they just said, no, no, we sir, work. you got to go down and, and get in line. We've got to rotate everybody. There's nobody here at this time, well, but you go ahead and load. Yeah. That's cool. But, but amid the tension, some close friendships were formed. What's going to get you through it? My friends, these guys here I work with, the Sheriff's Department, they're, they're really friends. And I just met them like two weeks ago when it's starting, when it's all started, and they're like brothers and sisters now. We got really close. Each night the call went out and hundreds from across Missouri and Illinois responded. They came out in force on this night, a sight all of us have watched for weeks. But we really never get to know the people who lift the shovels and fill the bags by hand, and I'm very sore knees. I'm from St. Charles, grew up here and I'm from town. Don't live near the water, but just from town. I wanted to come out and do some bags. Been working three or four days here, but I work otherwise today. This is my evening job. You know what her day job is? She spends nine yeah, hours a day yeah. as a radiological technician at St. Charles Clinic. This is Tom Kriegermeyer, a branch manager for McDonnell Douglas. I live in St. Charles. A lot of people, you know, they need something to keep the water out of their house. If we can do it, fine. I wouldn't want water in my house. So if I can help them to keep the water out of theirs, I'll do it. No problem. There are also entire families here, like the Willards, Timothy, Carmen, and daughter Elizabeth. Dr. Timothy Willard is a vice president at Milliken University in Decatur. They're in town on a family outing. We had, uh, we had plans to go to the Science Center today and uh, take in the sights of St. Louis since we were going to be here, but we've heard so much about this uh, disaster that we wanted to help out. We went back home, got our work clothes, and. All the way to Decatur? Well, we weren't that, <laughs> we were only 10 miles out, but uh, we thought it was a good thing to do. Something a lot of folks say they can't believe they're hearing is that other folks who aren't here sandbagging say they are tired of seeing sandbaggers on TV. Well, the folks here say that's too bad, because when there are people in need, you can never show enough or do enough to help. The floods don't go away. <laughs> the other disasters happen quickly and then they're over and everybody rushes in to help. But the floods are a chronic problem and it's going to go on for a long time. Every time it seems like we lose a levee or we lose some sandbags around houses, it seems to me honestly like the people get more determined. And they are in here like you say. Though I don't hear anybody griping. They keep coming back and they get, try harder. They just try harder because it's like they're feeling frustrated over the fact that they've lost so many times they're determined not to do it again. 
That same determination was felt by the troops and volunteers along the River De Pere. But by the 9th of July, it appeared no amount of sandbagging would be able to save the Lee May neighborhood of South St. Louis County. Water from the Mississippi was swelling the River De Pere alarmingly. But in the face of disaster, Lee May residents would learn what it truly means to be called a community. Betty Waters has lived in her home for 22 years, but now everything she owns is being hauled away. She moved out during the flood 20 years ago. This time the water is supposed to go even higher. It's terrible. It's bad, real bad. You don't know, you know. Betty's getting help from family members. She'll stay with them until she can move back home safely. Right now, they all feel like they're racing against the clock. When you, you only got a few hours to get it done, and they tell you they could go anytime. You see an example here, the dam come giving way. It's kind of rough. Betty says not everything in her house is going to go. In fact, all these knickknacks you see on the rafters are going to stay behind. She says if the water gets that high, that it will simply take care of some long overdue cleaning. Even though there's a chance Betty could go through another flood, she says she's staying in the neighborhood, even if it means going through this again. It's great down here when it's dry. It's a beautiful place and our neighbors are great. Even as residents packed up, the river began to lay claim to the neighborhood, seeking out weak spots and boiling out of the ground. The water came racing out of the hole in the sandbags and within an hour, nearby alleys and streets were under a foot of water. About an hour and a half later, county work crews sandbagged the leak and got it to slow down. But the scare was the talk of the town. Ain't you got some water up there? Come through you. Uh, yeah. Huh? Not yet. Not yet, but I suspect it will be by the weekend. The residents got the official word to evacuate early this morning, but many of them didn't wait until today. They decided earlier this week to get out. That was 48 hours ago when Joe Koch and his wife and two small children were moving out. They were moving out of this small white frame house when it was dry two days ago. Now the backyard is full of water and so is their basement. As more weak spots in the levee gave way, more onlookers were attracted to the area. Okay, let's go out to military and up and out. You don't belong down here. All the way up here. You go back all the way around. If you come down here again, you'll be arrested for trespassing. This is a closed go? area. Can we go back to there? Did you hear what I said? What did I say? Okay, you understand that, I guess. Yeah. Okay. The residents who evacuated about 150 homes in Lime are worrying more than just about flooding. I'm afraid about the looters maybe coming in and looting our homes. Why we're not there. So we'll have uniform officers out here all through uh, throughout the flood, uh, protecting the property and the safety of the residents in, uh, in the area. By mid-July, it appeared no community along the Mississippi would escape the flood. And new crest forecasts would underscore the danger of the Big Muddy, now bigger and muddier than anyone could remember. I was walking down the levee with my head hanging low. Live by my sweet mama, but she yeah no more. That's why I'm crying. Mississippi heavy water blue. We've lived here since 1945 and I've never saw anything like this. I'm so blue, my house and wide away. I'm crying in high long before North Bay Day. That's why I'm crying. Mississippi heavy water blue. It's an awesome, awesome sight. There are acres and acres now literally underwater. The president came and looked, Gebhardt came and looked, uh, they all came and looked, but the water's coming. It isn't stopping the water. This river is up uh, four feet higher than it ever was uh, in the history that these people have been living here. Says I'm worried, is a man can be, feed you like I'm about to lose my mind, that's why I'm crying. The first thing you notice from the air is how wide the Mississippi is now, and the further north you go, the bigger it gets. Further north, just past Winfield, we found a couple of broken levees, rushing water and flooded farmland as far as the eye could see. In Mark Twain's hometown, residents have erected a makeshift seawall to protect downtown Hannibal. 
The south part of town is already flooded, but Twain's home and museum reportedly is still safe. North of Hannibal, it felt like we were flying over the ocean. Photographer Dan Eyrick panned from one side of the chopper to the other to show you what we saw, nothing but water. And that scene will be repeated up near Quincy if the levee that stretches for miles gives way. Workers there admit the levee is soaked and growing weaker by the hour. By mid-July, forecasters were revising their predicted river levels upward almost daily. And with each revision, the scope of the disaster grew. This is News Channel 5 at 10. First it was an annoyance, then it became a major disaster. But new predictions put the Mississippi flood crest at 45 and a half feet in St. Louis. Our top story tonight at 10. A call is out tonight for more sandbaggers in South St. Louis. The city's fire chief sounded the call after seeing what you just saw, a new higher forecast for the Mississippi. Hundreds of families now face the very real possibility of losing their homes. I'm just worried, you know, you don't... Everything we have, you know, uh, it just, it's just overwhelming, you know, you don't know where to go or what to do. After weeks of anticipation, levees began failing as the first crest moved downriver. The Missouri began overflowing this levee bank about five miles north of the city of St. Charles on July 16th. The waterlogged sandbags gave way and a torrent of water flooded thousands of acres of residential neighborhoods and farmlands. With the added water from area thunderstorms, the Mississippi and the Missouri rivers began mixing upstream 20 miles from where they normally meet. As the water backed up, the Missouri reclaimed several small towns. The streets of Marthasville in Warren County looked more like canals after a levee break. More than 500 residents were evacuated. The raging waters also moved through Dutzow and Piers in Warren County. Another small town became an island due to a levee break. Calhoun County, Illinois city of Hardin is essentially cut off from the rest of the state after this break in the Nutwood levee. More than 600 people had to evacuate because of this breach. The Army Corps of Engineers says 11,300 acres are underwater because of this one break. 60 Hardin homes were washed away in this big levee break. Well, I don't have a home, but I'm going to my mom and dad, too. Flooded out. Flooded out. It's up halfway up our windows. The record crest on the Mississippi created a critical situation in South St. Louis. It began early in the day when there was a breach in the levee at Alabama Avenue. Water rushed in over 10 square blocks, and both residents and businesses had to be evacuated. Everybody, you know, started doing everything, trying to get their stuff up. You know, we knew we were in trouble. And we didn't know, I, I just never dreamed it was going to get this high. There were two more breaks in the same levee later that night, one at Prim Street and another at Sharp Avenue. City crews were successful in stopping these leaks, but the problems continued to the south in Arnold. There were several minor breaches in the levees as soaked sandbags dissolved under the pressure. The Mississippi backs into the Merrimack, which backs into the Palmy Creek, which backs into Bill and Velma Spencer's yard. It's just water, water, water. First time it's ever been like this. The Spencers built themselves a two-foot sandbag fortress around their home, but Arnold's mayor and the Corps of Engineers said that wouldn't be enough. That's when all the action started. <laughs> they come in rolling in here with sand and people, and we had a, about 100 people out here last night. The sand and the sandbags are from the city of Arnold. The sandbaggers are volunteers from all over. All around, Illinois, Imperial, South, Kirkwood, uh, Creek Car, just name it. Bob McGee was vacationing from Maryland when he heard about the floods. And it's uh, very depressing <laughs> to see people lose their homes and uh, just lose everything. So that's why we're here to help out. The Merrimack is expected to crest Monday at about 42 feet, and the Corps of Engineers estimates that'll be about here on the Spencer's levee. They've built themselves about well, a foot and a half of leeway just in case. With their reinforced wall of protection, the Spencers are confident they can ride out whatever nature sends their way. Let's stay here. It won't get in my house now. No way it's going to get in my house now. As the piles of sandbags grew against the River De Pere, some South St. Louis residents were upset, others defiant. We're so high, we're not going to leave until the dike breaks or until they turn our power off. 
we're older and we can't live without the without the air conditioning. <laughs> that rain sure didn't help anything down here. Everybody, I think, was all upset, crying, and and like they said, if you have to cry, cry. At the arch grounds, a simple yardstick told the story of the first crest. The water lapped at the 47-foot mark. The river then turned loose its power downriver, striking Kaskaskia Island in Illinois. As Illinois National Guard choppers swooped into ferry people to higher ground, the drama of human survival was being played out beneath them. More than 70 residents on Kaskaskia Island were fleeing from a raging levee break north of town. It looked fairly good this morning, and all of a sudden she blew. I mean, a stream came out a quarter of a mile straight out. While barges packed with loaded pickups and people crept across the Mississippi to St. Mary's and higher ground, Debbie Armbruster and her two children were catching the next one out. They told us to get off about 12 o'clock last night, but they had some trouble. What do you do now, just grabbing everything you can? Yeah, everything you can, possibly can. Get yourself off is the main thing. This was a dangerous exodus. Richard McConaughey escaped in his old VW bus, steering it through rising floodwaters. We had water about that deep in the interior of the car coming through, and thank God the engine kept running. By noon, all residents of the island had been evacuated. A Coast Guard helicopter conducted a farm-by-farm -farm check, carefully lowering crew members to the ground in a rescue basket, allowing them to secure homes. Right now, it's too dangerous for the women and children to go back into town. They've been kept at this levee with their entire lifetime of belongings at the water's edge. They're all hoping to get off all right. As worried family members waited for their husbands and fathers to return with belongings, their lives were piled into trucks, residents who could escape an island, but not the flood. Amazingly, no one was killed when the Kaskaskia levee broke, but the flood would claim dozens of lives in Missouri and Illinois, six in one accident alone. It was Friday, July 23rd, in South St. Louis County's Cliff Cave Park, when flash floods turned an outing into a tragedy. Volunteers who are experts at searching caves were called in to find the group trapped inside Cliff Cave in South County. It's tragic. So before you think about even thinking about going in the cave, you better second think it because you see the result. In all, four boys and two camp counselors died in what was supposed to be a summertime adventure. About 1,000 feet inside the cave, rescuers heard someone yelling for help. It was 13-year-old Gary Marr. And then we got halfway to the cave, and then water started coming in with currents in it. And then... And then we asked the uh, counselor, could we go back? He said, we are, I went here, and it's only about 10, min 10 more minutes before we get to the end of the cave. And if we go back, it's going to take an hour. So we kept on going. As the water rushed in, Gary quickly became separated from his group. Cold and afraid he was dying, the young man tried to keep his head above water. I kept on reaching up in the uh, top of the cave for uh, pockets so I could come up and breathe. And then I did that for about an hour, and once the, uh, then I got to one earth pocket where it was like a cliff I could hang on, and I held on to the water had went down. And then I just sat there on that cave. When uh, I saw the body float past, I was still reaching for earth pockets, and I still had my flashlight, and I saw a few of the bodies float by me. And then I, w I wanted to panic, but I, I was thinking about them and myself at the same time. I said, well, they already did. It's still a chance for me. Gary was given another chance. He says thoughts of his mother and family kept him alive. I was praying to God that I uh, make it out the cave alive and somebody would come in and scuff me. And then the next day, someone, someone did. I just like to thank all the people who supported and helped my family. And I give special thanks to God and the rescuers. The following weekend, the Great Flood of 93 would crest at its highest level. In one remarkable seven-day period, the rivers would go on an unprecedented rampage, wreaking havoc on thousands in Alton, Chesterfield, St. Charles, and the river counties of Illinois. The onslaught began Friday afternoon, July 30th, when the fragile standoff along the River De Pere was broken. We've got 51 uh, tanks 
with 30,000 pounds of propane in them. They were secured to concrete bases, and with the water being in that area so long, the concrete bases have come loose. So we got about 12 of them that are not secured. Well, we want the residents to at least evacuate a one half mile area around this complex. We've set up a deluge system with water lines so that should the product break and come out, we'll be able to spray water on it to dissipate it and also push it out into the river. The evacuation came swiftly as residents used to flooding dangers grabbed their belongings and fled. Emergency crews worked to stabilize the leaking propane tanks as paramedics stood by just in case. The propane is far away, but it's such a volatile material uh, that an explosion would be very severe. Officials keep pushing us back further and further from the site. They say it's a very dangerous situation. The stench of propane is still in the air in some spots. Though an evacuation order was in effect, some nearby residents didn't get the word until we broke the news to them. Nobody's officially told us anything. Magdalena Perez prayed for safety like she had done during the flood. I'm waiting for the lady next door, and she said that we're going to a, her daughter-in-law's house right now. A little frightened, though. Mm, I'm so scared. <laughs> I hope everything be all right. Dave Woodall and his daughter, Melissa, weren't taking any chances tonight either. There's so many rumors. You don't know what's really going on. There's no, been no one by yet. We're scared. Meanwhile, along the Missouri River, St. Charles residents were poised for action as they watched the river rise at an alarming rate. The water looked like it was within itself and uh, was holding its own. But all of a sudden last night, when it, it uh, suddenly uh, uh, came up about three feet and uh, much more than they had expected it to rise. And it's uh, just something that you have to uh, uh, work with and prepare yourself to prepare for the worst and hope that doesn't happen. Across the Missouri and Chesterfield, St. Louis County officials were taking no chances with the rising Missouri. Prisoners from the county's gumbo prison were loaded into buses to be taken to other jails. Given what was to come, the moves may have saved hundreds of lives. We have about 450 prisoners in both facilities in gumbo and we've got to get them out of there obviously. So. Uh, we can take about 300 in our North County Rec Center. We can take about 100 and put them in our work release area in this building here in Clayton. At the Spirit of St. Louis Airport, people who own planes were asked to relocate their aircraft. At the time, just a precaution. Businesses in the area spent that Friday removing critical records and equipment. There would be very little business done in Chesterfield that day or in the days to follow. Last hour sandbagging took place at Chesterfield Elementary, everyone doing their part to fight the Missouri River. I'm out here to on the city council and the call went out about 8 this morning. I've been watching the sandbagging in er other areas and knew that it would be coming here and so here I am. But only hours later, about 10.30 Friday night, the Monarch Levee gave way. In the dark, county police and other officials rushed to close off the Chesterfield Valley. They told us we had a half hour and then 15 minutes and then they said they were being evacuated and we had to finish our, our wall around the building. So Which building? What, what's your company? Uh, totally Engineering. How much stuff did you get out with? Uh, I'd say we got half our machinery out, but there's still some stuck in there we couldn't get out. They told us not to come back tomorrow, to get everything we could because we couldn't come back tomorrow. The true impact of the levee break wouldn't be known until sunrise, Saturday morning, July 31st. As St. Louisans awoke to today in St. Louis, Anchors Jeff Fowler and Gene Jackson showed the city and the nation some of the most incredible pictures we're ever likely to see. The Monarch levee broke at about 10.30 last night, sending water spilling into uh, an area of Chesterfield. It has flooded many farms. It has covered Highway 40 from just west of Clarkson all the way to Highway 94 in St. Charles. We are told in some places that the uh, uh, the, the water is four to five feet deep along Highway 40. And my partner Gene Jackson is in Chopper 5 with Alan Barklage at this hour, and they're over Highway 40. If you can see it, Gene, good morning. Jeff, that's the trick. Can you see it? It's tree line, and the water is almost up to the tops of the trees here in Chesterfield Valley. This is what happens when the levee breaks. The Monarch levee gave way at 10:30 last night, and right now there is probably five to six feet 
of standing water on Highway 40, if you can imagine it. Many of you have driven this strip of road many times, and this is what you'd see this morning. No driving out here. In fact, there was a rescue earlier, a very dramatic rescue, of a gentleman who was walking through this chest-high, neck-high water. St. Louis County Police put a helicopter down, rescued him. This gentleman evidently was left at one of the local bars out here to run a sump pump over the night, oh overnight, and I guess the water got a little too high and he tried to walk out. Uh, they did take that individual to the uh, Chesterfield Command Post. The entire Chesterfield Valley has filled up uh, with four to, four to six feet of water, and it just keeps getting worse. Uh, right now, there are some boats in the area. They believe they have just about everybody out of the entire area, but there are boats patrolling. Jeff, I was going to tell you earlier as we drew, as we flew out here, the Doubletree Hotel looks like it's on the bank of an ocean. I mean, it looks like it's a seashore resort. That's how massive the uh, the uh, water is at. Gene, now, Jeff, Gene can you? Yeah. I, I was going to say earlier uh, earlier this morning, Alan talked about the uh, the current out there. Can you still tell? Is there a lot of current? Is the water still rising there? Ab absolutely. In fact, we can head over uh, to the Monarch Levee and show you that the water is still rushing in over there. It started out as just a, a small break in the levee, and it's it's now 200 feet wide at least, and the water is gushing in. Alan was saying it's it's coming at about 10 knots, which is the speed the Mississippi River runs at normally, and this is in an area where there's not supposed to be water. So you can imagine the damage that's being done. And Jeff, the debris is, is just horrendous. There are floating crates, barrels with uh, who knows what's in them, uh, uh, cars, you name it. Gene, we can see just, or we just saw at the top of the screen, the Daniel Boone Bridge there. That gives people a pretty good perspective on the area we're talking about. And yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, there's just no way to get near that bridge. No way. In fact, the entire section of Highway 40 is closed in both directions from the Daniel Boone Bridge back to almost Chesterfield Mall to Clarkson Road. And the good thing is there is a bluff out here that's protecting most of the homes. Some of the railroad track, though, is underwater in front of that, br in front of that bluff. There's a Petropolis veterinarian and pet shop out here that's a two-story building, and the water is halfway up that building. You can only see the top story sticking out. Of course, Annie Guns and the Smokehouse, very popular restaurants, are both underwater. And there was one man up on top of any guns with his dog this morning. We don't know if he chose to stay or just couldn't get out. Gene, I got a, Gene, I got a call this morning from some people about some of the farms uh, west of Daniel Boone Bridge. I think uh, some people uh, are familiar with Rumbox out there, but I understand those uh, those farms are also underwater. Yeah, we're looking at it right now, and it's not a pretty sight. Rumbox, and right, right off Chesterfield Airport Road here, anything on either side is underwater. You can just bet. The farmhouses are look like they have got as much as six to seven feet standing there as well. On the ground, the only sound that Saturday morning was the clicking of shutters as hundreds viewed the destruction. I am awe-inspired. I have never seen anything like this in my life. This is incredible. I mean, we will, we will never have anything like this ever in our lifetimes again. Are you not impressed? I mean, all these people out at this hour in the morning just to come and look at this. I, um, it's devastating. It is devastating. On Chesterfield Parkway North at the Highway 40 overpass, dozens of sightseers stood along the police barricade for a look. The usually busy interstate is deserted here as it disappears under several feet of water. Incredible was a word heard over and over. The break in the Monarch Levee temporarily relieved some of the pressure across the river in St. Charles. Chesterfield's disaster caused the river to drop two-tenths of a foot, a temporary reprieve that seemed to strengthen the resolve of the sandbaggers working to save St. Charles. Well, I started out at West Alton, and I think everyone knows how that ended up. Uh, I don't like to think we lost them, uh, we just had to retreat a little bit. And thanks to the thousands of people that's come out here, uh, we're down to this and a few other places that need it. But this is uh, the people that's coming out here are uh, try trying to make this a personal one. We're trying to hold this one. We have a shot at this one, and we're really going to go for it. But as the sandbaggers worked that Saturday afternoon, the sky began to boil. Ironically, just when the rivers were at their highest level, Mother Nature sent severe thunderstorms just to keep things interesting. This was the picture from Chopper 5 as the storm front moved across the area. The rains came in torrents, but more deadly, the severe thunderstorms spawned tornadoes.
People near Dupo in Collinsville, Illinois, reported seeing a funnel cloud. Another was confirmed Lambert Airport, and the National Guard confirmed a tornado in Portage to Sioux. Winds gusted up to 65 miles an hour, knocking down streetlights in St. Louis, downing trees and power lines in Wentzville, and not far from there, they really received a scare at the Forestell restaurant in Forestell, Missouri. And all of a sudden, I heard a big crash. And the next thing I know, I look at here at the sign, the Texaco sign is falling through the roof. Fortunately, everyone inside had just gone outside to look at a helicopter landing. No injuries, everybody, it was a restaurant, everybody was out of the restaurant. Luckily, there were no injuries whatsoever. As Saturday turned into Sunday, the attention of St. Louis and the world would turn to the bottomlands of Illinois. It would be a memorable day where the river would once again show its incredible power. The drama played out live on News Channel 5 as Jeff Fowler, Gene Jackson, and helicopter pilot Alan Barklage narrated the live pictures from Chopper 5 as it hovered over the Monroe County farm of Virgil Gummersheimer. There's an actual breach in the levee at the farmhouse and water's just flowing through it at a tremendous rate. Now the problem is, you know, they could probably have another hour or so up on the levee before too big of a problem, but if that levee starts to go, there's no telling how long the levee or how large of a stretch of the levee will break at one time. The difference between the levee break earlier and now as we come around the tree here, it's unbelievable how quickly this water starts coming through. It's digging a pretty good sized hole, probably five feet deep right now in front of where that, that levee was. And the sandbags are being washed right down in there with it. You can see it coming around the other side of the farmhouse now and filling up in front of some silos. Water is pouring through into this area. Yeah, it's, it's racing in there now, Alan. And uh, it, it's getting bigger by the minute. Before too long, this is going to be a major break in the levee. Uh, if Joe can pan over and show us the house, uh, I think you have to wonder whether the house is going to be able, the home is going to be able to withstand the force of the water. Here we go. Here goes a part of the shed that held and housed a lot of the animals. It's now washing away. You saw the walls collapse underneath and the roof and, and the contents are now washing away in that flood water. Uh, that house is uh, starting to go. Oh, Jeff, it's unbelievable. There it goes. Just now lifted off the foundation and it's just crumbling in the rapid and the violent waters here that are coming through this levee break three miles south of the Jefferson Barracks Bridge. We've watched the silos go, we've watched the barn go, we've watched a shed go, and now the house itself has been lifted off the foundation by these floodwaters. It's, it's just unbelievable. And this the is trees all... are actually snapping in two as well. This is, this is uh, it, it's just a tragedy. Alan, in relationship to what you've already shown us, maybe Joe can get a wider shot and, and look back the other way. How many other farms do we have there that might be Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna bring it around and we'll show you as Joe comes by. There's some farms out in the background there. And you can see that the, there's still farmland here and this water just keeps heading towards the farmland as we come all the way around. There's another big farm that's, and some of these farms are, there's 10, 15, 20 feet of water in the farms already, and it just continues to march south. Yeah, you know, yesterday, you were up over Chesterfield all day yesterday, uh, and uh, granted it was a couple of hours in, but I don't remember seeing the water uh, anywhere any more powerful than what we're seeing right here. No, it just shows you how high and how strong the Mississippi River is right now and continuing to rise. You can see there as you look down at the house, uh, the siding, it looks like, apparently has uh, literally been ripped off the side of the house. Uh, all you can see is uh, wood uh, underneath. It's, it's just going to be a matter of time. I mean, the, the house is basically destroyed now, and as well as the outbuildings, the sheds. The farm equipment that was here was just simply rolled over as that water came through. So the force of the water just tremendous. More dramatic pictures came from the banks of the Missouri near St. Charles. A levee protecting a quarry was topped, creating a huge waterfall. As water-soaked levees up and down the Missouri and Mississippi weakened and gave way, hundreds more families would fall victim to the great flood of 93. How hard is this for you just emotionally to handle all this? Tough. Seeing her mom tough. cry. Yeah. She's in there and she's worried and she's scared. She's a year away from retirement and wanted, that's it. I mean, mostly seeing her. 
because get the house paid for, get the cars paid for, and be able to retire. You don't plan on losing your house. What? It's a year from August she retires. As the rivers peaked, the sense of loss and despair sank in. Well, we sandbagged all night all we could, and then we saw we was losing the battle, so we just started putting everything up, putting our, our, uh, our chest and everything up here it's on top of my kitchen counter here, so keep from losing our stuff, you know, because we don't have no flood insurance. And then finally, later on, it started to flood, and kind of the water just came out into the crawl space and started just flooding the basement here. We moved the uh, washer and dryer up because we knew this would come up, you know. So then we do crafts too, so all that wood stuff's floating around. <laughs> Grief turned to action in St. Charles that Sunday. But elsewhere, the second crest was causing new problems for thousands. Well, another dangerous situation quickly developed in the his historical town of St. Genevieve today. The Spring Valley levee there gave way, sending water charging into the town and forcing an emergency evacuation. Backwater from the Mississippi crashed through the mouth of the Spring Valley levee, opening an 80-foot hole that is now beyond repair. On the ground, sandbaggers frantically tried to make up the lost ground, but it was a losing and exhausting battle. A sand boil is blamed for opening the levee. National Guard troops and local civilians were called in to start sandbagging. They start sandbagging. Within minutes, it spread. They couldn't contain it, and the levee blew. The Coast Guard, National Guard, people who live in St. Genevieve and others who just wanted to help tried in vain to save several historical homes. Amaro and Beckett Rebo, built in the 1700s, have been flooded. Others are in jeopardy. Before the levee burst, homes in the back here were completely dry. They had no water in them whatsoever. When the levee burst, people like Brad Boyer had to frantically rush to save their lives and their family's home. All of a sudden, this big old piece of driftwood just come down and nailed me. <laughs> Tried to, we had to get out of there. It was just coming too fast. So far, 50 homes and businesses have been evacuated from the south side of St. Genevieve. Residents are holding their breath and praying for the water to subside. In South St. Louis, sandbaggers fought to stay ahead of the record crest. Hundreds of people today sandbagging in the heat out here. And of course, officials also expanded the evacuation area along Germania in South St. Louis today, asking more people to leave their homes on a voluntary basis because of the shaky condition of the levee. Again, it's expected to crest here at 50 to 51 feet. Along the river to pair, a close watch was kept on both the high water and the floating propane tanks. Small leaks developed in the strained piping, leading to even wider evacuations. Sirens blared throughout the surrounding neighborhood, and police officers went door to door telling people to leave immediately. The flash fire happened just after 7 at the plant at Catalin and Water. No one was injured, but more than 75 firefighters and 15 fire trucks were immediately called to the scene. They just told us that the uh, tanks are on fire and to get out as fast as you can. We thought we was in a safe area until about 10 minutes ago, and the cops come by and uh, no uncertain terms get out now. Carloads of people could be seen leaving the neighborhood. Police barricades prevented anyone from getting into the area. In Alton, Illinois, water problems struck on two fronts. The Illinois American Water Company plant in downtown Alton shut down this afternoon after flood water began backing up through the sewer system. It flooded not only the water plant but many businesses through downtown Alton. The water distribution sites that were set up last week in and around Alton are busier now as more and more residents are turning their faucets on at home and getting nothing. It just quit all of a sudden, so I figured I'd better come up here and stock up a little. I did all my laundry and everything ahead of time. Other residents have water service, but they don't know for how long. When I left at about a quarter till six, I still had water running. But I don't know if it'll be when I get back or not. Hopefully it will. I got all containers filled, even little cool whip containers. The city says the bulk water distribution will continue until further notice. On the streets of downtown Alton, bulldozers work to fight the unrelenting pressure of the Mississippi, which by Sunday had seat beneath the city streets and buildings. I guess one of the biggest problems we have is uh, thinking about what's going on underneath all of our streets with all the pressure that's there. 
uh, washouts. We've had a lot of problems with that. Uh, that's what's happened with the, the last night with the uh, water coming up through the streets and pushing a blacktop off, uh, then creating a water spout. And uh, so we had to fix that by covering the whole street with about three foot of a uh, two inch rock so that it puts the pressure back down the whole thing in place. Rural areas weren't spared either. Chopper 5 found the SOS painted on a farmer's barn, Save Our Horses. It seemed everywhere, everyone and everything was pushed to the breaking point. And as the sun set on this remarkable weekend, it seemed everything that could go wrong had. But the river had one final trick to play. The trouble started just before 11 last night when the floating Burger King and Taco Bell restaurants, the USS inaugural minesweeper, and a helicopter pad broke free from their permanent dock here in front of the arch. Police and firefighters quickly converged on the arch grounds, but there was nothing they could do. The boats had already struck the Poplar Street Bridge and floated further downriver. By midnight, officials had located the runaway boats and corralled them with tugboats. After a close inspection of the damage, the Poplar Street Bridge was reopened, the last event of a memorable weekend. And as the sun rose Monday, the consequences of the havoc wrought over the weekend became clear. The shutdown of Highway 40, added to the many other roads and bridges closed by the high water, made the Monday morning commute incredibly difficult. Tens of thousands of commuters inched along the highways, and it would be weeks before traffic would return to anything resembling normal. The Great Flood of 93 had also become one of the area's greatest tourist attractions. Thousands lined the riverfront under the arch and the banks up and down the rivers just to stand and look at the mighty river. We've got 13 grandkids that someday will want to see this because this is a 500-year flood. We won't see another one like it in our lifetimes or theirs. Over the next few days, the situation in St. Louis would stabilize. Then attention would turn further south. The many breaks in the Illinois levees now threaten the small towns situated in the bottomland along the Mississippi. All right, you're looking live now from Chopper 5 at a picture of Valmire, Illinois. Uh, this is uh, just downriver from all of the dramatic footage you saw yesterday of the farmhouses uh, near off the Mississippi River. We have a couple of levee breaks here. The uh, Fountain Creek levee was the only thing protecting Valmire and then south from there. Those creeks have gone. Uh, we're swinging around now. Photographer Joe Young is going to try to give you a shot of it. Several levee breaks. The water is pouring in here. Valmire is underwater. Uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of acres of farmland are now underwater. And Alan, we were talking just a minute ago. There is now nothing to stop this water from going all the way down to Prairie de Roche. The townspeople of Prairie de Roche, along with numerous volunteers, were about to wage the final major battle of the Great Flood of 93. For the most part, the town was evacuated, but those fighting the river stayed on. And this is going to be our last stand right here. We hope that this will protect our village from the, the mighty Mississippi sitting right here in our back door. Levee workers learned to read sand boils like tea leaves. The fate of Prairie de Rocher would depend on what the sand boils were telling them. It's starting to get soft right here. All right. Soft and sticky. Yeah. Here's a, if we let them settle down. Cool water is water that's coming up from deep underground, and that's an indication that we do have seepage coming up from below. If it's surface water, it's been heated by the sun, and it's warm. That's very cold. As the sun set, a big National Guard helicopter ferried tons of sandbags to the area in question. Farm trucks were also commandeered and thrown into the fray. As the copter landed, workers rushed to unload the cargo. It wasn't anything special, just those sandbags. The plan, fill a huge sand boil where the river was seeping underneath the levee. It was too dangerous for us to be nearby. Workers were wearing life jackets. One man watched the riverside for whirlpools, a sure sign of a break. It's scary work on shifting soil. A hundred square uh, foot area that uh, sank about six to eight inches. Now that's uh, not good. You don't know how much hollow spot there is under there and that's where the danger is of people standing on that thing and working on it. That's why they didn't want to bring in the heavy equipment. This earlier view shows the area causing the trouble, seepage threatening the whole levee and the community. The hundreds of hours of work by volunteers, National Guardsmen and residents of Prairie de Rocher has been a success so far. They have been able to stop the sand boil seepage. 
question is, how long will they be successful, and how long will the water stay on the other side of these levees? We've had a lot of people working their butts off down here, trying their best to keep this thing under control. Do you think you have it under control? Uh, we hope we have it under control. Who knows what's going to happen? We're still in a very critical situation. In a gamble to save the town, the Army Corps of Engineers developed a plan. They would cut a wedge in the Mississippi River levee, allowing water to flow in to meet with water advancing from the north. But hopefully when the water comes down from the Columbia area all the way through that's moving down this way, that we can equalize both sides with the water they let in and then have the water flow out back into the Mississippi. What are your chances of this working? Uh, well, I guess we won't you know until they try. That's, yeah. that, this is basically the, the last thing left to do to keep the town of Prairie Rocher dry. Then yesterday morning at 6.30, the plan went into effect below us. A wedge was cut into the Mississippi River 300 feet long and five and a half feet deep, and the water from the Mississippi River started rushing in. Within hours, this dry field filled up with more than 15 feet of flood water. The plan was working. But as John Burtsborn was reporting the heroic efforts live via Skylink 5, we all got quite a scare. Someone thought there was a breach in the levee. People began running away from the levee. This was live on our 5 o'clock news. Now, I really, I, I can't tell you what's going on. Everybody is evacuating this area. Sir, could you come over here for a minute? He said, we got to get out of here, folks. Uh, I think we're going to load up and, and move out. The water looks as though it might be heading our way. So reporting live from Prairie de Rocher, I'm John Pertzborn. Let's go back to you. Luckily, it was a false alarm. As the sun set, townspeople watched and waited. The water rose through the night, but the levee held. The next day, John Pertzborn reported on the big gamble from Chopper 5. High above Prairie de Rocher, you can see the plan is working. Flood water continues to pour into the Mississippi River along planned levee breaks. Meanwhile, the village's 54-foot high levee is holding, and the water level is going down. What's it look like to you? About seven under the tape, seven and a half above. So it's gone down that much since yesterday? It's starting to recede. They, they've cut enough out. It looks like it's going out. Uh, as we were talking about, I, I was just amazed that they were able to stop the flow over that north levee, and we just can't thank the people that came down and, and helped enough. Yesterday, hundreds of sandbaggers rushed in to help. Today, the scene is much different. Only a few low spots remain and an occasional sand boil, but a crane is taking care of that. Does it look like you've got it licked? I think we do. I hope we do. The gamble paid off, and Illinois' oldest village was saved. The rivers would recede in early August, but as the water vanished, the true impact of the Great Flood appeared. Thousands of homeowners and business owners would face a bittersweet homecoming. I at least have got my kids to help me. So we'll make it. Good Lord's with us, we'll make it. But these poor people that have never been through it, they don't know the worst is yet to come. They've got people helping them sandbag. They've got people helping all over. But you don't really have all that help when you start cleaning up. It's your stuff you're throwing away. It's your stuff. And it means so much. Gene Lane boats up to his electronics business, ready to retrieve what he didn't get out before the Monarch levee broke. This is what he sees for the first time. Uh, it's just a total disaster. It's, uh, it's, it's all destroyed. There's nothing left there that is solvable. Walking around, Lane tallies up his losses so far. I'd say probably uh, 300000 Just Just asking that. That's, you know, and that's, that could go up as, uh, as we evaluate the, uh, the heavy-duty equipment, the precision equipment. The river has dropped about five feet. It will have to go another five feet before Lane really knows what's here and what's gone. But he's already looking ahead. We will come back, yeah. Will we come back in this area or not? That's undecided at this time, but we will come back. The business will go on. Dick Rabko has been the manager of Spirit Airport for 29 years, dedicating his career to the Gumbo Flats of West County. So with this in mind, I went with him earlier today to look at the airport one week after the Missouri River forced its way in. Being here for 29 years, seeing this place grow from 
you know, a little strip out in the middle of nowhere to what it is today. For you to look out at the water covering your baby, it, uh, it must have killed you. Well, you know, we had the, we had the tears uh, initially, but uh, I think that, uh, you know, you got to put your nose to the grindstone and say you're going to recover. You're going to do it bigger and better than ever. A lot of people's livelihoods depend on this place coming back. This airplane is a, a foreign aircraft that was in here for maintenance, and uh, it was the only uh, aircraft that one of our operators, uh, Jet Corp, uh, couldn't get back together, and you can see why. There was a lot of work to do. While the soul of this area has gone, it's gone for just a while. It and the businesses that are now in hiding will return, and the Gumbo Flats will be the area it once was, and then some. Spirit of St. Louis Airport's going to be back better than ever. Uh, you have my word on it. The fire department boat took Daryl Mullenix back home for the first time since he fled 17 days ago. Along the way, he saw other homes and businesses nearly covered with water. And then he saw his house. It's all empty. He hit the attic yet, though. Thank God. But once inside, Daryl found out he was wrong. The water had been in here. The smell is overwhelming. Mold is already growing on clothes and furniture. It must have got up in here pretty deep because, man, everything is just slimy, slimy. Daryl has lived in this neighborhood for 15 years, but it took him only a few minutes today to find out he won't be coming back. You must have to wonder if you're going to be able to go back in there again. No, probably not. There's no way. I mean, there's just too much damage, you know. I'll probably just push it over with a bulldozer. In the wake of the water, some people left their homes, some went back, and the controversy about building homes in the floodplain continues. The great flood of 93 changed many things. It changed businesses, changed lives, and changed our sense of security. And depending on how the controversy about building in a floodplain is resolved, it may change our landscape.